You push him to rock. Die, Rocky, die. People said he may look good, but he don't deserve to be winning all these fucking matches, and they turned on him. So he used that, and he used the animosity he had because he was out there trying to, you know, carry on his father and grandfather's name and trying to smile and trying to do the best he can, and they fucking hated his ass because they sensed, you may be special, but you ain't special yet, and you're getting pushed for you're ready. So he used that, and he said, okay, and it was believable. It was believable that he would, he would be resentful. It was believable that he would take his frustration and his anger out on the people for saying, die, Rocky, die. And all of a sudden, then he started getting some heat as a heel, and then when he started getting more confidence and all the rocks started coming out, then he started becoming a cool heel, and then the people turned. Because the people, your most successful babyface heel turns or heel babyface, actually your most successful heel babyface turns, people will turn them first. People will tell you, we're starting to like this guy, if you listen to him as a booker. And then you just give him more reasons to like the guy while he's still doing what he's doing to make him like him. Because if you just turn a guy, uh, heel's getting over, he's getting popular. So you turn him babyface. Next week he's out kissing babies. People go, where the fuck did that come from? We liked that prick because at least he'd go out there and kick somebody's ass and wasn't worried about what people thought of him. Now he's kissing babies. Now you've killed him. Let the people turn him still let him keep doing the same thing he was doing that made him like him in the first place, and slowly give him a credible reason to say, okay, I'm going to fight that guy now. Turn on his partner or somebody else on that side that wants something to where he's not just playing up to the people. He's doing it for a reason for himself, but now they get to see this guy kick the ass of that guy that they hate using all the tactics that he usually used to kick the ass of the baby face they love. There you have it. That's perfect. That's how they managed to make us baby faces for a short period of time because Heyman could have turned to Tiller the Hun baby face. But that's they wanted to see me fight him because, my God, I'd never want to fight in my life. But, he, you know, he may be a prick, but he's our prick, Cornette, whereas this fucking prick's from New York and we're in Atlanta, so fuck him, we like him better. Process of elimination. Won a popularity contest, you know, Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan battling it out for top spot, right? But that's... You know, that, that's, that's something that you have to do to put people in a proper place. It's, it's, it's not about, this isn't writing, it's not about writing scripts, and it, it's about feeling. It's about emotion and psychology, and there's somebody out there that would love to see Kermit the Frog be the world heavyweight champion. There's some, I know there's one, there's got to be one, because there's somebody that likes everything. If, you know, they wouldn't, if, if there wasn't somebody on this planet that liked everything, the German porn industry would be out of business, okay? So there's somebody that likes everything. What you have to do is you have to try to narrow it down to people that a broad range of people that would like something. You know, I don't care who wants to see Kermit the Frog. They can do their own wrestling thing. I'd rather see the people that want to see Stone Cold Steve Austin. Give me that crowd. I like that crowd. I can make some money off of them. So you've got to find something, talent, that appeals to a wide variety of the audience and put them together in situations where the people are interested to see what happens. Winners and losers are always good. Championships should always be important. And why did you piss on my leg and I'm going to get even about it? Don't make it too fucking complicated. People don't watch TV with a goddamn notebook. Same thing with the matches. Actually, some, of, some fans these days on the Internet that don't get laid very often do watch the matches with a fucking notebook. Oh, well, goddamn, I'll have to take points off for that, Mr. Hurricane Rana. <laughs> Fuck you, just goddamn, you ain't doing it. Give them a fucking break. They're trying. Some of them suck, but some of them are good. And some of them suck now, but we w would be good if you give them a chance. So lighten the fuck up. Okay. Um, who are some of the, the wrestlers, maybe current day would be better, but some of the guys from another era, that people should study? And why should they study these people? Well, we can't go too far back because there's no way to study many of the people until the mid-'70s. <laughs> because uh, there was no videotape and very little film. Um, you know, I, I, once again, I'm very heavy on Jerry Lawler because, God, he was he was a classic baby face. He was a classic heel for his time, for his uh, region. And who else do you know that, that, you know, has drawn crowds to the same building in the same moderately sized southern city for the past 30 years? And he just sold... 5,000 tickets to see him and not much else. Um, 
you know, in, in the Coliseum, like, what, a month ago. He started main eventing there in 1974. And in one year alone, he drew like 370-something thousand paid admissions with him on top most of the time. you, you got to watch Ric Flair, obviously. Now, I'm not going to talk about a lot of the newer guys because everybody's seen him and everybody studied him. Uh, I'm not trying to knock uh, or, or leave out a Mick Foley or a Steve Austin or a, a, a Rock or, or, or some major name like that from the past five years. But if you want to go back, study Dusty Rhodes. Because of his gift of talking, his, his promos, his ability to talk people in. And, I mean, look at Dusty. I mean, uh, you know, he was not the most physically imposing as far as a bodybuilder, but the people thought he was tough. The people believed in him. When you go back, you look at anybody that drew money that was on top for a long period of time, especially in more than one territory, all the NWA champions. For, for, for that matter, a lot of the top stars that worked St. Louis, a lot of the top guys in Florida, big wrestling territory. The 80s tapes from Atlanta, you know, TBS both before and after Crockett took over. You, you, the guys can learn something from almost anybody that was really in a money-drawn position in this business. There were flukes and flashes in the pan and people who made it six months in one territory and never went anywhere else again. Eh, leave that for later. But watch the top guys. Watch the guys that had the titles, that carried the territories, that got most of the television time. I guess what I'm saying is, watch old stuff. Because now what's old is new again. We wouldn't be doing the Midnight Express reunion after 20 years if they didn't want to see... That stuff lingered in people's memory. We're not going to go out there and do the same kind of match we did 20 years ago because we're all 20 years older. But what we did 20 years ago lingered in the fans' memories to where they want to see it again. If the wrestlers can ta of today can take from the, the guys today and also take from the guys of 20 years ago and see maybe... Dory Funk Jr. and Jack Briscoe, St. Petersburg, Bayfront Center. They went 60 minutes. They had a legitimate wrestling match. You couldn't see a hole in anything. They didn't hit the ropes that much. There was a lot of three or four minute headlocks in that 60 minutes. Wouldn't play today. People's attention spans are shorter. They got remote controls. They got clickers. They got MTV. You know, instant gratification, escort service. Can I have a blowjob and a pizza? I'm surprised that hadn't been done, by the way. Yeah, pizza, pizza and escort service. Get it all done all at the same time. But anyway, so now, so what you do is you take that 60-minute match, you take out the four-minute headlock, you put in a 20-second headlock, but you do the shit that they were doing elsewise, and you got a nice 18, 20-minute match, and it looks good, and it'll be exciting, and the shit you can do. When you steal from one person, it's, pl it's plagiarism. When you steal from many, it's research. Do what fits you and, and get these little ideas, these little tips, these little hints. And you can see what guys did to get over and make themselves memorable. Because ultimately it's about selling tickets, it's about drawing money, and you can't do that unless people remember you and they know when they came to see you they got their money's worth. And why did they? Because you did something that connected with them. And there's, there's so many moves now being done that are death-defying and guys are putting themselves in hospital. But at the same time, it boils down to this. The check is the same for the match, whether you go to the hospital or whether you just have a nice match and go home to your family. So I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying don't lay your body on the line in the right situation, but pick your spots. And more importantly, it's not how many bumps you take. It's when you take the bump that you do take and whether the people like it, remember it, and it means something. Get to match over. You don't have to kill yourself. So everybody needs to, to think more, bump less, and realize that you're, it's performance art, you're telling a story, you're connecting with an audience, and if you have the personality, the capability, and the psychology, then there's been a lot of people that weren't real athletic in this business made a lot of money just because they could get the people here, and that's what you need to do. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I take a small bow.